European Center for Law and Justice and the International and Foreign Law Committee of the New York County Lawyers Association. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this conference, the inaugural event of the Lawfare Project. It is an edifying privilege to serve on this events committee, along with our co-chairs, the Honorable Robert Morgenthau, the Honorable Erwin Kotler and Columbia Law School Dean David Schizer, as well as with Nicholas Rostow, the Chair of the International and Foreign Law Committee of the New York County Lawyers Association, and with Jay Seculo, the Chief Counsel to the European Center for Law and Justice, all of whom have so generously provided their time and their wisdom. The Lawfare Project is extremely grateful to have the opportunity to convene such a distinguished group of speakers, some of whom have traveled from England, from Canada, from France, from Israel, Utah, Washington, D.C., to gather today because they share, together with all of us, a concern for the integrity of the law and our legal institutions. So perhaps it's appropriate to start the day with a definition of lawfare. Although not a new phenomenon, lawfare was brought to the attention of the modern world in an essay by Major General Charles Dunlap, who gave us the title of this conference, The Use of the Law as a Weapon of War. The definition has since been expanded to include the wrongful manipulation of the legal system for strategic, political, or military ends. Often, Lawfare takes the form of a complementary legal campaign to terrorism and to asymmetric warfare. This type of lawfare is aimed at delegitimizing and frustrating the actions of nation states who have dedicated themselves to the eradication of terrorist methods. It consists, for example, of the exploitation of orchestrated law of war violations, such as taught by Al-Qaeda manuals that instruct its captured militants to file false claims of torture so as to reposition themselves as victims in the eyes of the media and the law. The text of one such manual has been reprinted, reprinted in your conference book on page 187. The goal here being as much to win a public relations victory as it is a court case. We see this legal tactic also being used by specially designated terrorist groups like Hamas that attempt to achieve legitimacy by instituting human rights litigation in England, while at the same time openly flaunting human rights norms by, amongst other things, murdering their own children as suicide bombers, child soldiers, and human shields with impunity. Proponents of lawfare fight with a variety and a combination of offensive legal actions employed in both domestic and international courts of law. We are witnessing lawfare at the United Nations in efforts spearheaded by the Organization of the Islamic Conference to exclude attacks on American civilians from any definition of terrorism and in the same group's manipulation of the Human Rights Council to enact uh, a law that bans defamation of religion globally. Lawfare techniques also include frivolous and predatory libel lawsuits brought against authors, politicians, members of the media, and even cartoonists who are brave enough to speak publicly about issues of national security and public concern. It includes workplace harassment lawsuits against counterterrorism experts who brief our police and our military on the threat of radical Islam. The cumulative effect of these lawsuits is leading to a culture of fear and a detrimental chilling effect on the speech and on the proliferation of the opinions of the very people who are supposed to be protecting us. The very existence of lawfare calls into question the concept of universal jurisdiction as they are being used to affect war crimes prosecutions against democratically elected officials, such as Belgium's attempted prosecution of former President Bush and former Prime Minister Tony Blair, such as Spain's prosecution of six top legal officials in the Bush administration, 
and such as the state of Jordan's demand for the extradition of a Dutch politician to stand trial for blasphemy. Lawfare can also be pursued through a lack of action when such action is necessary to maintain the peace and in the pursuit of justice. Love that. Concepts like the disproportionate use of force, collective punishment, and the unlawful targeting of civilians are less examined, if examined at all, vis-a-vis -vis the terrorist groups and the states that sponsor them and the banks that sponsor them. When little to no legal accountability is demanded of Hezbollah and its agents remain free to cross European borders, well, at the same time, Israel's foreign minister, C.P. Livni, is threatened with an arrest in the UK, we have a problem, one that evidences bias in the application of the law and a disregard for the concept of equality before the law. There's no doubt that legal decisions, both home and abroad, influence the methods we use to fight terrorism and affects our ability to win the war of ideas. Requiring highly restrictive rules of engagement in battle and overly protective legal procedures during the custodial period has systemic effects, both positive and negative, on the military's entire approach to war. So how do we delineate between that which is lawfare and that which is counterproductive and that which is a legitimate use of the law? Well, it's not as simple as some may like to put it. It's not as though lawfare against, you know, legal suits against terrorists are bad and lawsuits against us are good. No, the question is not who is the target, but what is the intention behind the legal action? Is it to pursue justice or is it to undermine the very system being manipulated? Questions that I hope will be answered today by our panelists include, to what extent, if any, should international humanitarian law be enforced in domestic courts, you know, via the Alien Torts Claim Protection Act, for example, and the foreign equivalents? And should a UN voting bloc that's comprised of largely undemocratic member states dictate human rights norms? How we answer these questions has implications, not just for Western defendants, but also for the victims of mass rape in Darfur, also for the victims of genocide in Rwanda and the families of those displaced in Argentina. In recognition of the significance of these issues, the Lawfare Project was recently established. The project's goal is to raise awareness about the abuse of the legal system and human rights law. We are dedicated to mobilizing resources and bringing interested parties together from a broad spectrum of views in a common forum to discuss this threat. We have a wonderful program planned for you today, so please remember to turn off your cell phones. Following each panel discussion, we encourage everyone to engage in the Q&A period, and we remind you to kindly limit your statement to a short question we would like to give as many people as possible the opportunity to engage. We also respectfully ask of our speakers and panelists to keep their address within the time limit. Finally, Attorney General Cuomo unfortunately could not attend today, but he sends his best wishes to our guests and to our conference participants. District Attorney Mr. Cyrus Vance also extends his regards and wishes us, quote, a free and frank debate unencumbered by politics to examine the interplay of security and law. Ruti Titel will not be able to be with us today, but we are very happy to add Professor Ruth Wedgwood to the program. And with that, I introduce to you Mr. Nicholas Rostow, the chair of the International and Foreign Law Committee of the New York County Lawyers Association.